Hello, so I want to start this off with just one quick question. Uh, how many patches do you currently have in queue that need to be implemented? Would you say it's over 100? Raise your hand. Over 500? Maybe over 2,000. Okay, so as we know, there are a lot of patches that most of us are sitting on top of. So this is a report that was just recently done by uh, Qualys, and uh, probably you've seen this number quite a few times, but over 26,000 vulnerabilities were discovered just in 2023. And if you were to look at this overall landscape of vulnerabilities, wouldn't it be nice if you were certain on the high-risk vulnerabilities that are in your environment so that you can really prioritize those patches and risk in your environment. So if you look at this report, you see that there are known um, exploitations or KEVs, there are the ones that are uh, published, there are the ones that are um, the zero days. And that's what we're really going to focus on in this discussion. So if you had a huge amount of unpatched vulnerabilities in your environment, how would you patch them and how would you put that into priority? So typically, if you have a continuous monitoring environment, which most have today, what you're doing is you're connecting your asset inventory to the published CVEs. Can I show, can you show me how many of you guys usually approach it that way? All right, so quite a few of you guys. So um, that is typically then ranked on a critical to moderate to you're okay by not patching. So I'm gonna introduce a very novel approach for you to consider. Uh, in uh, a few years ago, DARPA funded object security to look at the uh, risk prioritization for commercial off-the-shelf devices. And in looking at this challenge, we approached it with a hybrid static to dynamic symbolic execution, or really, I should say, AI. Um, the uh, particular way that we looked at this is we wanted to go beyond web applications. So typically, if you're using um, dynamic application uh, uh, testing, you are doing that with web applications. Well, we know that embedded devices, uh, even though a lot of us have evolved into Industry 4.0, we're still looking at embedded devices uh, that are still connected to the network, but are not web applications, so we can't really use dynamic. Um, the other thing that we were looking at is um, looking at it from a binary level. So when you have end of life devices, when you have legacy devices, fragile devices, um, you're going to have the firmware for that, but you're not gonna have the source code. And typically with static to dynamic application testing, you are needing the source code to do that. So we didn't wanna have a reliance on that source code. Uh, the other is to be able to plug into DevSecOps CICD pipes. So if you were to look at what the um, end result of our research and development was, it was really to combine hybrid static to dynamic symbolic AI. Now, symbolic AI is your old fashioned AI. Uh, and I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail on that. Um, but what it's going to allow you to do is to detect a weakness, and in this case, a potential zero day, and then verify it with abstract reasoning. So if I were to drill this down into the static application testing, you are moving away from the software source code and looking at the firmware image. And we're looking at the entire firmware image, which is typically in the nature of a patch, an update, or even a new deployment. 
Now, uh, the other thing that we're looking at on the dynamic application um, testing is looking at vulnerabilities in the functionality of the, of the firmware. So looking at um, memory uh, vulnerabilities, looking at um, weak pointers. And then the third that we're doing from a symbolic execution, as many of you know, you really shouldn't be doing testing for any device that is in production. And while some of you might have digital twins and you're able to do the testing in your digital twin before you take it into production, um, having the ability to do the symbolic execution to test is an advantage. So um, if you look at what symbolism is in symbolic execution or a symbolic AI. Um, it is an ability to abstract um, in the logic programming of the firmware. And then you take the um, facts and rules of the software and you convert that into symbols. So just to show an uh, example of this, and this is just generic code, uh, you can take then relationships and a symbol in this particular case where you have a, a parent and then a grandparent and a child, you can then associate each one of those um, facts as a symbol and then relate a rule, kind of like Boolean logic, to, that, um, to those symbols. So in the case of looking at um, firmware images for vulnerabilities or potential zero days, you're able to then associate those symbols. A buffer overflow may indicate a path to a weak pointer. A path to a weak pointer may point to a weak pointer. So in applying that to OTICS, we took the symbolic execution and uh, applied that to constraint solving. And I'll show you how we do that in a second. And then reasoning that or showing proof of the potential zero day. So as examples of that, you can predict violations um, at the logical programming level, or in this case, weak pointers. You can look at the accessibility how can I get to that weak pointer? So actually identifying the potential paths or possible paths to that weak pointer. And then exercising that verification through testing. So going back to that facts and rules and being able to do the actual symbolic execution to see if you're um, uh, positive of the location of that weak pointer. And then you can uh, prioritize that risk. Is this a violation? Is this a vulnerability that can impact me on a severity level? Uh, the next is, uh, how is this going to impact my compliance? So how many of you are um, working with 62443? So you know that you've got a lot of different parts to 62443. You've got 3-3, um, you have 4-1, you have 4-2. Um, and sometimes it might take a great deal of time to map your um, vulnerabilities to your compliance framework. And the same goes for NIST 853 and 882 and other frameworks. So what we're proposing is that take advantage of automatic mapping of the discovered CWEs to your compliance framework. And then the last but not least is the code hardening uh, capabilities. That if you're able to find the weak pointers, the paths to the weak pointers, the potential zero days, if you're able to then hand that over to your DevSecOps team for hardening. Now obviously if you're um, working with a COTS device, that information would be communicated with your manufacturer. You don't want to do hardening without talking to them about that because that could void your warranty, et cetera. But sometimes you might have an end of life or a legacy asset where that manufacturer may not even exist anymore. 
I uh, worked with a uh, coffee roaster. They were working with a roaster that was over 30 years old and it was a point of vulnerability. And so they couldn't go back to the source code or even to the manufacturer of that roasting device. They had to be able to um, manage it from the firmware image perspective. So a couple of suggested workflows. Um, the first is if you are an asset owner. So how many of you are asset owners? Okay, so I'd say about maybe 20% of you guys. Um, in your particular case, uh, the, uh, a really great workflow to consider is looking at your legacy or end of life devices, those that you do not have monitoring on, no sensor or agent. Uh, and you may have a patch that is still waiting in queue. The thing that um, we're suggesting is not to completely trust that patch that is sitting in queue. You should really run it through an analysis to see if that patch may introduce net new vulnerabilities, or maybe there's another version of that patch that you should be installing instead of the one that you have in hand. And then running it through the hybrid static to dynamic symbolic AI to do the firmware image analysis. If you're on the DevSecOps uh, side of the fence, so how many of you are with manufacturers? Couple? Okay, so, um, you know, we've all been drilled the cyber-informed engineering perspective, so this is really an opportunity to shift left, even though you may have a device that is um, legacy or may have some tech debt involved in it. There are a lot of devices out there that are a result of mergers and acquisitions that need to still be updated. So um, whether or not you're in uh, code development or DevSecOps or even legacy integration, that's a good place to start. And then running the uh, static to dynamic um, uh, AI to then review the binaries and then remediate. So uh, running a couple of scenarios, so this is scenario one, where a firmware image was uploaded for analysis, and as you can see, a weak pointer was identified. Now, if you see a lot of the academic papers for weak pointer analysis, it is definitely considered to be um, a theoretical academic process until um, until we were able to actually get this to, to market. Um, but with weak pointer analysis, there's also a lot of false negatives and false positives associated with it. Still pretty new um, review of binary. So recognizing that, using the, uh, the symbolic AI to run the rules through to make sure that you are confident that there are no false negatives or false positives. That weak pointer truly is there. It is running outside of its functionality um, and it could be a potential zero day. And then actually providing the possible paths to that weak pointer. Uh, then uh, looking at the auto disassembly and, uh, and uh, decompiled code, you can actually uh, point directly to the CWE in the code for remediation. And you can uh, go from hex code to hex code or weak pointer to weak pointer because often weak pointers exist multiple times within the same code if it does exist. And then the auto mapping to the compliance framework. So in this particular case, it was mapped to 62443 3-3. And as you can see, there were three unmet requirements associated with 62443 3-3. And in this case, it was malicious code protection. And then uh, being able to add yet another layer of information, and that is, has it been exploited before? So looking at the KEV, and relating it to the firmware image that was analyzed. So let's look at scenario number two. 
Scenario number two, running through another firmware image and found a weak pointer. And even found one possible path to that weak pointer. But through the symbolic AI, actually not so certain that this is one that can or should be remediated because there's a possibility of a false negative, um, false positive associated with it. So helping you through the prioritization between scenario and scenario, scenario one and scenario two, is if you are running through finding weak pointers, finding paths to weak pointers, knowing about known um, exploits, uh, actually seeing the weakness in the code, but through the symbolic AI not being able to verify, it helps with the risk prioritization. You're going to automatically um, prioritize scenario one over scenario two. A lot of you may ask, how long does this take? Well, it really depends on the firmware and the device that it represents. So if you're looking at a sensor, um, you know, you're not looking at very many binaries in that, in that file, and it can take minutes. If you look at a PLC, uh, you can look at sometimes 10,000 binary files in one firmware image. And that can take up to one day to do the analysis um, on a Kubernetes cluster because it's doing a lot of different layers of analysis. On an HMI, again, not, uh, not terribly uh, large firmware file. And a lot of times what we're doing is we're working with um, airports because the HMIs on baggage claim are rather vulnerable. They're sitting on older um, operating systems. So being able to upload an HMI to the system to prioritize the risk. And the reason why I brought up um, the numbers of around 2,000 vulnerabilities, that's the typical number of vulnerability patches that an airport is sitting on to prioritize. So you want to make sure that you're, um, that you're focused on the right things at the right time. So very easy, straightforward, scenario one, prioritize scenario two, probably put that on the lower part of your stack to, um, to patch. And it was proactive, it was automated, and it was fast. Uh, this is currently being used in large nuclear environments today uh, and, and manufacturing, looking at prioritizing uh, risk primarily of the um, end of life legacy um, uh, devices. And another interesting thing that is being used for uh, is when you look at uh, Industry 4.0 devices, which are you know, primarily web-based, you might have a web app that's associated with that PLC that you are, that you need to manage um, or patch. And so it can handle both sides of the Industry 4.0 picture for you. So with that, um, any questions that you may have? Hi, uh, so you talked a bit about having uh, firmware of different sizes, you know, from very small in a sensor to very large in a PLC. Uh, are any of the uh, pieces of, of you know, binaries that you're dealing large enough that you can't run symbolic execution over the entire thing because of the explosion of uh, you know, paths and constraints? And if so, how do you decide where, like, wh which subsections to run the symbolic execution on? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the last part of that. Uh, uh, the, the, the binaries that you're dealing with, are any of them large enough that you can't uh, run symbolic execution on the, the entire thing? Oh, are, I mean, if, if, do you have any devices or images that you cannot scan? Is that what you're asking? More or less, yeah. Uh, we have not come across anything. Um, as far as binary file types, um, architectures, et cetera, we have not come across anything that has not been able to analyze yet. Um, we're not doing uh, jitted code. Uh, so, you know, from that perspective, uh, yet, but haven't come across anything that we haven't been able to analyze yet. Cool, thank you. Uh, the other, uh, and that brings up a point, I, I get this question a lot with the uh, symbolic AI is, whose data are you training on? 
so we actually um, developed our own corpus of data uh, and our own uh, level of facts and rules that sit in that corpus. So we're not training on third party data or the end user's data. Thank you for that, Susan. Any additional questions? Okay, very good. Thank All you right. so much, Thank you. Um, Susan.